Hello there, and welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series on science epic that attempts to retell the story of humanity's march into outer space from the days of Sputnik in 1957 to what's going on today in 2017. From the space race to SpaceX, I like to say, I'm your host and guide through the wide open skies and beyond as we embark on this journey together on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. Right, welcome to part 9 of our story, 60 Years of the Space Age, following our last chapter in part 8, where we took a look at the events following the October 4th launch of Sputnik. We described the common reactions of the major world powers at the time. For Russia, the Soviet Union, that had launched Sputnik on the Semyorka rocket, it was all about a successful propaganda campaign, with the United States of America being its target. For Russia, the Sputnik launch was mainly a show of force, demonstrating the strength of the communist superpower to the world in 1957. It was like an announcement on the world stage of the Cold War that the USSR meant business. <laughs> right. Through the launch of Sputnik, the Soviet Union demonstrated that its technology and its people were the leaders in the endeavors of exploring the space frontier. They showed that its reach and influence as a nation could encompass the entire globe through the reach of their rockets that were able to cross vast distances and even perhaps lay claim to the stars themselves. You wonder what could possibly come next. The first Sputnik was carried to the stars in early October on a missile that was built by the Soviet Union as a means of striking military targets all across the globe. But its most likely target was the North American continent. The missile, called Semyorka Little 7, was powerful enough to reach out farther, higher, and beyond any distance ever achieved by any similar device before it. The Russians were quick to follow up their success one month later in November with the launch of the sequel, Sputnik 2, or Sputnik 2. It was the second fellow traveler to be launched into orbit, but they designed this mission to be even more special. It would push the boundary even further. Usually in science, when you're the second to do something, coming in second place, it isn't really as remarkable as the first time and the first person to do it. The first person to discover the theory of relativity, like Albert Einstein, is pretty remarkable. He got pretty famous. But the guy to do the math the second time around, the second person to verify his math, not so famous. You wouldn't even know who he is. But the Soviets totally upped their game on their second trip to space with Sputnik 2. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev had ordered chief designer Sergei Korolev to do a follow-up rocket launch immediately after Sputnik 1 in order to capitalize on the moment of the 40th anniversary of the communist Bolshevik revolution in November, which was another propaganda stunt to glorify the image of Soviet Russia. Chief designer Korolev was all too happy to oblige, using the hype from the Sputnik launch, the first Sputnik, as a platform to further his own interests to eventually one day put a man in space and venturing out ever deeper into the cosmos. Now, Chief Designer Korolev, he wasn't like the leaders of the Communist Politburo. He was in it for the science. He was in it for the value of exploration, as was usually with most scientists and engineers. They do it for the hell of it, and they do it to push the boundary. And the Sputnik 1 launch generated a lot of hype from the people of the Soviet Union. Speaking of hype, the Soviet people got on that train harder than an E3 crowd at an EA press conference. The Soviet people at the time showed that they were really interested in space, as if they were gripped by a wave of rising enthusiasm riding on the tides of possibility. 
that had emerged with the new frontier. The space frontier had only been open for just a couple of years, and yet its effect could be felt greatly. For Sputnik 2, the Soviets would put a living animal into outer space. The first ever creature from Earth to explore the universe was a mixed breed stray dog named Laika from the streets of Moscow that flew into Earth orbit on the 3rd of November, 1957, one month after the original Sputnik launch. Truly, Laika was the first explorer. There was never ever anything else Laika. <laughs> Get it? Hey, hey, what up? Laika was to pave the way for humans to one day go to outer space because scientists at the time were very uncertain, unsure about two very essential aspects of space travel. Number one, could a living creature survive the journey up into space? And number two, what are the effects of microgravity or weightlessness on living creatures? Now, going to space via rocket involved a lot of heavy acceleration forces from the explosive reaction that the launch vehicle produces in order to break free from the influences of Earth's gravity. Laika was to test whether these insane forces would be harmful or even lethal to living creatures and also to test the effects of the weightless environment of outer space. Laika was unfortunately destined to die at some point during her flight because the means of safely coming back down to Earth from orbit was not yet invented. She was the first living explorer of the space age and also its first casualty. In the years to come, there would be more brave souls that would go, that would boldly go but never return from their mission to the stars. Sixty years since Laika, we've begun to understand the cost of space travel, not just from an economic and the resources and materials involved to go to space, also from the cost of human life. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, as they say. The flight of Laika on the Sputnik 2 was commemorated with a statue in Star City, Russia, in 1997, forever remembering the... <coughs> Morty! Forever remembering the sacrifices of Soviet space dogs made towards pushing the boundaries of the space frontiers. The Sputnik 2 payload to orbit was five times that of Sputnik 1, increasing from a humble 80 kilos to 500 kilos this time. This substantial increase in payload capacity added to the fear factor generated by Korolev's R-7 rocket, causing even more panic and concern on the side of the United States. Sputnik 2 flew for more than 100 days and made more than 200 revolutions around the Earth, eventually surpassing the number of orbits made by the original Sputnik. And in, in the midst of all this, the United States was absolutely shocked. To the Americans, the Soviets, of which they had considered as technologically inferior, lackluster, and pretty much straight up plain evil, achieved within the span of one month not one, but two godly acts of technology that reached as far deep into the souls of the American citizens as it did into the very boundaries of outer space. The world was forever changed. That was 60 years ago in the space age. We've changed even more since. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The reaction felt in the United States following the Sputnik launch is interesting because it really had something to say furthermore about the state of human concerns and interests at the time. It would not be the last time in history, but with Sputnik, an incredible act born out of science and technology became of great interest to the state of affairs and emotions of the people of an entire nation. Now, I'd like to think that another time that this had happened on a similar scale before was in the previous decade in 1945, when America dropped the atomic bomb on, on Japan, which was an act born of science and technology that left a great psychological a tremendous 
psychological scar and impact on that nation felt until today. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki left a scar on the Japanese people, profoundly transforming their beliefs and character as a nation. A similar event to this would happen again in 1957 with Sputnik. This time, it was America's turn to feel the impact. It was as if the very spirit of America had been shaken by Sputnik. The Sputnik crisis was almost as impactful and significant as any other major act in global politics could be. It certainly generated a tremendous amount of change afterwards. But instead of an act of war like Pearl Harbor or 9-11, it was an event largely driven by science, technology, and exploration. And I think it's vital that we understand and get a better appreciation of these moments because, as Carl Sagan said, we live in a society and civilization highly connected and dependent on science and technology, and that those who do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Well, the last part wasn't Carl Sagan, but both quotes ring equally true. And to America, Sputnik was definitely bad news. President Eisenhower at the time said that if the Soviet Union became the first country to achieve significant military capability in outer space and create an imbalance of power, it could pose a direct military threat to the United States. So I guess it was similar to an act of war, don't you think? Beyond just obviously threatening the security of the United States like that, what was also more surprising was how the Sputnik event entered the mainstream consciousness, the mainstream human consciousness of the people of Earth. As was evident in the Soviet people, like I mentioned earlier, everyone on Earth started to care about space. Almost how like sports would become relevant in our age as an indicator of national pride and the value of your country, progress in space would become a relevant measure of how competitive significant and relevant your nation was on the world stage and I think it still does actually but on a lesser scale it's more subtle nowadays whether you have fast internet or slow internet and that's the level of technology of your country and that reflects just how how relevant your country is among all the other countries of the world and it was this type of opinion of, of measuring the power of your nation that would drive forward the space race with Sputnik, the Americans realized that the space frontier as an endeavor that could influence the hearts and minds of people all around the world was every bit as important as the power projected by its army and its military, as well as its economic wealth as a nation. And this would determine exactly how America would respond to the great challenge posed by Sputnik. The Americans would respond very prudently to Sputnik. The first step was to get their own satellite into orbit, and they did that with the help of Werner von Braun, who was this former Nazi German scientist. Now, he had been captured by the Americans, and they had kind of stowed him away for a while. But he was finally now given the chance to come into his own in this, in this field of expertise. After nearly a decade in captivity under the Americans, events would transpire that would allow von Braun to demonstrate not just his technical savvy in the field of rocketry and engineering, but also his charm and swagger in talking to the public, promoting space and trying to advance the space frontier on a more personal home front, sort of like what I'm doing here. Yeah. I'll probably make a side story to elaborate the experiences of Von Braun as a science communicator and science popularizer, which will be interesting to look at and observe his change from a Nazi to an optimist about the future potential of humans in outer space. It's time for a science wrap. From serving the Fuhrer to pushing the frontier, everybody gonna know that Von Braun is in here. Wanna turn it up with the rocket thrust? All them commie bastards gonna throw a fuss all the way to the moon and back. Not gonna use these rockets for attack, but to carry dreams of my species A. Looking to make it to better days. Yeah, Young Terra, 2017. 60 years of the space age. Lit. Von Braun would become a legend in the adventures of the decades to come, one of the principal characters we will have to watch out for in many episodes to come. 
America would fully enter the space race when it launched the satellite Explorer 1 into orbit on the 31st of January 1958, four months late to the history books, four months after the first Sputnik. There was a failed attempt in December 1957 called the Vanguard rocket, which was supposed to be America's entry into the space race with another rocket that was not designed by Von Braun. It ended up crashing back down to the launch pad. <laughs> Splat. I'm telling you, if you want quality, you gotta buy Deutsch. So the Explorer 1 satellite made it to orbit at the end of January 1958. It was smaller than Sputnik, far smaller, at only 10 kilograms. The Russians belittled it as a grapefruit compared to the mass of their Sputnik, but what it lacked in size, it definitely made up for in design and functionality. Just like something else that lacks in size and makes up for in functionality. Hey, you get what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You see, most of Sputnik was very much a dead weight, an empty mass like a cannonball with some radio antennas that was shot out into space at the tip of an R7 multi-stage rocket. It was designed like this to actually save mass and to get it to space first. It was designed like this to actually save on mass and to get to space first for focusing more on simplicity of design. All the cool science equipment was taken out. Sputnik 2 was more or less the same except it carried the dog Laika and the instruments on board made to monitor her life science which blanked out on the second day of the mission. Oh, so sad. Poor doggy. The American Explorer 1 satellite carried an Iowa cosmic ray instrument that was used to take readings of radiation levels in low Earth orbit. This instrument discovered a peculiar source of radiation surrounding the Earth. This radiation belt was named the Van Allen belt. The Russians could have discovered this belt as well with Sputnik 2, but the spacecraft was too far out of radio range from any ground stations to relay back sensor data. History could have seen fit to give it the name the Vernov Belt instead of the Van Allen Belt. Another narrow miss for the Americans. But why is the Van Allen Belt so important? Well, the Van Allen Belt is a collection of charged particles caught by the Earth's magnetic field that acts as a protective shield for our planet's atmosphere. And I very much like the atmosphere. It helps me with my breathing. Not sure about you, but breathing is something I really cannot live without. So the Explorer 1, flying at more than a few hundred kilometers above the Earth, discovered the Van Allen radiation belt, which was a major milestone in planetary science. We discovered that our planet possessed these fuzzy patches of radiation surrounding it that prevents cosmic rays, these intense rays from outer space, from stripping the surface of the planet clean of life. And this, scientists believe, is what happened to Mars, and it's why Mars is so desolate and barren. It doesn't have this protective shield. Mars does not have a similar protective shield around it. The Explorer 1 discovered on its journey a shield of heaven that protects the world from the harm of cosmic rays. We very much owe our earthly existence to the Van Allen Belt, and if we hadn't gone to space, we wouldn't know about it. Space exploration speaks towards further enlightening us with a deeper understanding of our place in the universe. What other wonders would we have discovered since then? What wonders would we discover furthermore into the future as we rush headlong, farther and deeper into the depths of space? Regardless of what we will discover on our journey to space, we owe it to the first explorers, the likes of the Soviet space dog Laika and von Braun's Explorer 1 satellite as the pioneers of humanity's future among the stars. The open road still softly calls like a nearly forgotten song of childhood. If you enjoy this type of work and wish to see it continue, support us by donating to us on Patreon, and I will be truly grateful. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.